that time it kicked in. Okay, we're ready to go. So this is um, by popular demand, by popular request. This is part three of uh, Photoshop 101 Crash Course. I intended it to be part one, definitely, part two, probably, but wasn't sure I was going to um, or keep you guys in, in, invested to do a part three, but I asked at the end of the last stream, hey, you know, um, let me know in the chat if you want a part three, and people just kept commenting even on the replays. Oh, yes, definitely do a part three. So today is part three. Uh, we're going to focus today mostly, I keep saying this every week, it seems like, but we, we don't really focus it, but we're going to focus it today for sure on two things mainly we'll cover other things along the way but two things mainly because again they're they're important for people starting off on photoshop um, and that is uh, selections and layers those are like two important very important things to get your foundation right once you get your foundation right in those things uh, then learning the other parts of photoshop making adjustments you know sizing things whatever that becomes a lot easier because you'll have the basic understanding of Selections and layers. Selections and layers. So we're going to try and stick with today. I sprinkle in things along the way, but that's it. All right. And again, if you're watching on um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever else, just be sure to head over to b.net slash Adobe Live if you have an important comment that I'm not seeing on the other chat. Otherwise, we will, um, we will uh, continue on. And again, I'll try and look at both windows, but I, I don't see anybody yet on the other platforms because we started a few minutes, we started like a minute late over there. Uh, and thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, I was live, I was hosting Victoria yesterday and she was doing all kinds of Lightroom and Photoshop cool things. So go back and check her stream yesterday. And I was just hanging out, you know, adding little pinches of techniques. For those who saw that, you'll understand that reference. All right, let's go ahead and dive right into what we're going to be doing. So um, I thought one of the things for beginners might, I mean, maybe you have great images already to use, but a lot of times people say, well, can you share your images so I can do what you were doing? And uh, a lot of the images I'll be showing today came from Adobe Stock, and I won't, give you, I won't be able to give you every single reference number, but one of the things I wanted to make sure that you knew is that, um, you know, because first thing comes to mind, Adobe Stock, I have to pay for that. No, yeah, that's true normally, but there is a free section of Adobe Stock, meaning images you can download and use royalty-free without paying a dime. So how do you get to that free section? You just simply go to, and here I'll do it myself, stock.adobe.com, com slash free. So that's the URL to get to the free stuff. Um, now, of course, that's not the entire library. And, you know, you might, depending on what category you're searching for, you might not find as many results because those are the free ones, but they're free. So uh, I'm going to be using the things that I'm showing today from the free collection. So what I did is I went to the free collection. I typed in the word, the word soccer field. And uh, of course, that brings up you know, a variety of different soccer field images, which is great. And I grabbed um, this one, which says licensed, even though it's free, it's a, you, know, you have to license it. And I grabbed this one, which is the, in my case, the sixth result. Um, actually, this would be a good one too, to show another example, but we'll stick, well, let's go ahead and license it so you can see that process. All right, so when I click license, what happens? Uh, I'm already signed in. Nothing. That's it. It adds it to your uh, Creative Cloud library, which again, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about those yet. And I have a library called Selecting Subjects that it added it to by default. Uh, if it didn't add it to the right one, you can click Manage and put it in the library you want it to go into, or you can move it after the fact. But Creative Cloud libraries, think of those as they're not just specific to Photoshop. They work in all applications except Lightroom. <laughs> Uh, but they work in Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Premiere Pro, After Effects, so forth and so on. So you can put things in the library, images, text, styles, colors, so forth and so on, and use them in all the other programs. So that way, uh, it's like managing um, assets in the cloud. And of course, they work in all the applications except Lightroom. All right, so let's, uh, now that we grab two of those images, let's pop over to Photoshop and see where they are. So if I go to Photoshop, 
and I go and remember I showed you how to get into Photoshop from the welcome screen. You just click the little PS icon. And when I go to the PS icon, my library icon is this icon in the upper right hand corner. It looks like, I don't know, little bookmarks and it's called libraries. And when I click on that, I navigate it to my selecting, because I have more than one, I navigate it to my selecting subjects library. And if I scroll through, there are the two images I downloaded from Adobe Stock. So, um, yep, that's, that's how you get images from the free collection to Adobe Stock. And you can also download them uh, to your hard drive just as a standalone image in your downloads folder. All right, so let's say that I open up this one. I double click on it. That opens it up. And um, so same, same procedure, if you had an image already on your hard drive, you would just double click on it and open it up. We, we talked about that. We're going to um, tear off the layers panel because I'm going to keep it handy so that it's always there. So next up, I want to now open up my next image. So if you were to go in uh, stock, you could probably find a soccer ball and you can find a soccer player. So I, again, I did these a long time ago. I don't have the, uh, if you screenshot that number right there, I don't know if this one was free or not is the problem. But anyway, go look for a soccer player and a soccer ball and you can kind of play along. All right, so I'm gonna open up this soccer player and I'm also gonna double click and open up the soccer ball. Yep, I know it's a different profile. Great. So now I have all three images open. Um, not in my library, gotta be more specific. Oh, I get it downloaded immediately, not in my library. Um, are you signed in to your Creative Cloud? Do you have a library created? Those are some things I would check. Um, but if it downloads immediately, you can still play along until you figure out what's going on with the library. All right, next up, let's, uh, so I have the three images open in tabs. So the first image I open, second image I open, third image I open are all there. And you can kind of see where we're going with this. We're gonna start putting some of these images together. Now I'm gonna zoom this image up so we can see it bigger. So to do that, I can do it from the keyboard. I can also go up to view and just do it. So I can say view uh, fit on screen. That's command zero uh, or PC control zero will fit on screen. So I just made it bigger so we can see it. Next, I'm gonna go to the soccer player and I want the soccer player to be selected. Just the soccer player and the ball, no white background. Again, we can do this, as I've been saying for the last two weeks, 50 ways. So I could drag the image over and then get rid of the background. I can select the, the, the subject first, copy it over. I could erase the background. I could mask the background. I could, do a, I could do select and mask on the background 50 ways. So I can't show you all 50 ways, otherwise we, we would spend, um, found it. Okay, great. We would spend uh, all day or all hour just on this one topic. So let's move on. Um, I wanna get this soccer player. I'm gonna show you a way. One way is to let Photoshop select it for me. So I could do this a couple of different ways as well. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and say select subject. So select menu, select subject is what I usually default to. A lot of times people will just say, well, I already know what I want. I'll use the object selection tool. Both methods are great. Um, and I, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. As a matter of fact, let's, let's do it both ways and see. So if I say select subject, here's the problem. What's the subject? In my mind, it's both. It's the soccer player and the, and the ball. But in Photoshop's mind, that may not, it may not agree. So I selected the player, but not the ball. And there is no select subject again. Select subject, get the rest. Well, I could go back to the tool we talked about, the object selection tool. Shift, click, and that will add to the selection. Great. Now, that gets the both selected, but it may not be. Zoom in on his, his fingers here. That little white hole should not be selected, but but because select subject over to the ball, there is um it, it's confused on this because the white the ball's white and it's also a white background, so it gets kind of confused on selecting too much. So um, these are these are problems, and I could try it the other way and see if it does a better job. Let's go do that. Let's zoom out. Let's come up. Let's deselect. How do we wrong? And then I can go to the object selection tool and instead of clicking, I can just simply drag a big rectangle around both. And that kind of tells Photoshop I want both of those objects selected. And that did even worse.
on the ball. It didn't deselect the hole. So that's even a worse selection. I'd have to do more work there to fix all this. So again, Command D. And again, sometimes you will do trial and error. You will use two or three, which did do a better job of selecting him. And Shift click the ball, which will do the ball as well. So now I got at least the bulk of what I wanted. What was the decent? Uh, copy this. We can drag and drop. We can delete the background. We, all kinds of things. Let's just simply do simply do a copy, because when you copy from one image to another, <clears throat> Photoshop does it the right way. When you paste it into the next image, it pastes it as a layer. Okay. So let's go in. Are we buffering? Mm, we could be. Du, 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 du. I do see something on YouTube saying it's buffering. The other channel looks good. Everything. Oh, yeah, I see something going on here. Hang on one second, folks. Let me see if I can fix your buffering. All right. It went green again. Let's continue on. Hopefully that will fix it on the YouTube side. All right, anyway, let's... Uh, dun, 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 dun. Momentary buffering didn't last long. Not buffering on Behance. Okay, great. Yes, buffering. <laughs> I could stop it and start it again. And hold on, let me let me do that real quick. I'll stop it on YouTube and start it again. So I'll be right back. Okay, I should be back. I'm waving until I see myself. Okay, good. I'm back. All right. So uh, hopefully that fix it. I, I don't see the yellow anymore letting me know this buffering. Okay, next. Move on. All right. So I got those two things selected. Let's go ahead and do a copy. And then let's head over to the field, which is the first image I downloaded. Now, again, I'm still in that object selection tool. So as long as you stay in that tool, everything's going to highlight that it thinks it's trying to select. So I get out of that tool just to stop it from annoying me from doing that because I'm not trying to select anything. So I just switch to the move tool by default. And then I'll go ahead and go up to the edit menu and choose paste. All right, so let's do paste. And that will do exactly what I said. It will paste it onto a new layer in the layers panel. Here's a layers panel right here. Call layer one because it doesn't know what it is. So I just called it layer one. I'm going to uh, double click on that just so we can keep track of things. Soccer player. You may call him soccer player. You may call him football player. You're both right. All right. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to go to the soccer player and uh, go ahead and lock that name in. And now we're going to fix our problems. We're going to fix the little hole in his hand that's still showing white. We're going to fix that excess white around the ball. All right. Now that we got those two things uh, to concentrate on, the next question is, how do I fix them? Now, from a rudimentary Photoshop back in the 90s way, you would just erase the white. But that's a permanent, you're adjusting the pixels permanently and you may like erase too much and then not see it and can't come back from that. So it's time to learn about layer masking. So let me show you the difference. If I, oops, if I were to zoom into that little spot on his hand and I were to grab my eraser tool and I were to make my brush smaller with the left bracket key on a US keyboard next to the letter P, and I were to start erasing, that works. You know, I could zoom in, I could do a really good job and get all that white and do it nice and clean, even with a mouse, that, that kind of worked. Okay, but once I save this, once I move on, those pixels are gone for good. There's no getting them back easily. I'd have to go back to the original image to get those pixels back. So let's undo that. A better way, whenever possible, whenever you're trying to remove something, is to mask it. Because masking is temporary, meaning it's not permanent. You can always unmask if you ever decide to. 
So for example, I could go in and on any layer, not the background, but any layer, you can uh, add what's called a layer mask. So let's let's go over some layer properties real, real quick too. So, cause we're, I said we're gonna talk about layers. So first and foremost, you have um, the layers panel, which I tore off and, and made it float. You have uh, searching, so you can search by kind, name, effect, so forth and so on. So you can, if you ever decide to search for your layers, you can. You can, um, uh, you can turn a layer on and off, so that just simply hides the layer. The layer is still in the file, can always be turned back on. You can lower the opacity of the layer. So once I lower the opacity of the layer, I'm making that layer more transparent. Um, so this can, all of these things are properties of every kind of layer you, you or every layer you create. Um, now, all of these lock things, lock various, th various aspects of the layer. So lock all means the layer can't be moved, it can't be erased, it can't be touched in any way. It's like for people that are accidentally moving layers around and they, don't want, they want them to stay where they are. Over here on the left is one of my favorites is actually lock transparent pixels. So that means that I could do things to, the, to his skin, for example, but don't affect the background. So for example, if I lock the transparency and I were to grab a black paintbrush or green paintbrush in this case, my default color is green, and I were to come out here and start painting, nothing happens because the transparency is locked. But as soon as I come across his hand, his hand gets green. So that's a cool way, an easy way to apply effects to parts of your image without affecting the transparency. Just locking the transparency will do that for you. So I'm gonna undo that and I'm gonna unlock the transparency. Locking the, uh, I think these are the pixels, locking the image pixels is the opposite. It allows you to um, lock just the pixels of the layer and you can't do anything else. You can't add any more pixels, so forth and so on. This is locking and I'm, I'm locking the position. So just the position, it can't move, but you can do everything else to it. This is uh, preventing any auto nesting out of artboards and frames, and that's a more complex feature. Frames is, is for a designer. Um, artboards are usually for designers as well, and we already talked about lock all. Now, what's the difference between opacity and fill opacity? Fill opacity is the whole thing. Fill is just the inside of it. So if I had, and this, this won't count, but if I had something with an outline around it, it would fill, it would lower the inside, but not the outline. Um, so that's what the fill opacity is for. All right, then you have all kinds of uh, additional things you can add to a layer, which we're gonna do. We did a, we're gonna do a layer mask, which is this icon right here. So select the layer, click the third icon from the left, which is layer mask. That will add this white square, right, white rectangle by default. So just so you know how layer masks work, they, they're not color, they work in grayscale. So black completely hides what's on the layer. White completely shows what's on the layer. Every, color, every level of gray in between is a level of opacity. So think of it as once I add a layer mask, if I paint on that layer with black, I'm hiding whatever I paint. It's not permanent because I can always come back and paint with white. If I paint with white, I'm revealing whatever was hidden on that mask. So in this case, if I uh, come back and now instead of using an eraser, I use a black brush and I come back to this. And again, I start painting with that black brush ever so carefully to get rid of the white. Great, the white's gone. But let's say I, I went too far, oops, and I didn't notice it right away. I didn't, like, I, I come back tomorrow after I open this file back up. Oops, I, I painted over that finger. That shouldn't be gone. Well, if it had been erased, it would be gone. It's gone. The pixels are gone. Once you save it, they're gone. But a mask always will let you come back to that. So if I come back to that with white paint, flip the colors around, and paint it back in with white, I'm just putting it back. So that's why masking is always going to be the preferred method as opposed to um, as opposed to erasing. So erasing is kind of what we had to do back in the day because you didn't have masks, but you didn't have layers either. But now that you have layers and masks, we very rarely ever do erasing because that's permanent. 
All right, now let's come back over to the ball. Now, this gets into technique. I could, now that you know what we're doing, we're on the same layer with the same mask, I can come in here and I can start painting black to erase that extra, or hide, I should say, hide that extra white around it. But is that the most efficient use of my time? Probably not. So let's learn a better way. So instead, let's come in, let's deselect. I'm going to show you just another technique again out of 50 ways. So I need to get rid of a lot of white around the whole ball. Like it's, it's, it's less in some places, more in others. But at the end of the day, there's white sticking out, especially on the left side and the right side. Now, we already know I could mask, um, painstakingly go in and zoom in and mask the whole thing. And that will take me a few minutes to get it right and not cut too far in and not leave some. But maybe there's a more efficient way. So you got to remember, you're either on the mask or you're on the layer. I don't want to be on the mask right now. I want to be back on the layer. So I'm going to click on the layer. So you can toggle back and forth between those two. You're either on one or the other. Notice when I'm on the layer, my foreground color goes back to green. But when I'm on the mask, my foreground color is black because it can only be black, white, or gray. So that will be another indication of which one you're on. All right, so now that I'm in the, um, I'm on the layer itself, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell Photoshop once again to select the, just the soccer ball. So I can come over here and I can just click and it does a selection around it. And it's sure enough, it's selected again, the white parts as well sticking out from the ball. Great. Now what I wanna do is I wanna let Photoshop bring that selection in, contract the selection. I don't wanna to have to do it manually. And you might be saying, well, Terry, along the top, it's perfect, it doesn't need to be contracted. But if it were contracted, it wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it. It wouldn't matter because there's no outline around the ball that's going to be damaged. So a lot of times you're doing, these, the, you're doing these things to be more efficient and it's not going to make enough of a difference for anyone that would care or notice. Um, and if you're a perfectionist, then go in and do it painstakingly along the edge and do it right. All right, so let's go in. Now that we, we did that selection, let's go up to our select menu and let's choose modify contract meaning bring it in expand would be the opposite take it out we want to bring it in so contract now this is the part you're not going to know right off the bat you're going to have to guess because it's going to vary by the resolution of the image but i want to bring that in by let's say six pixels and and that's not a huge amount but let's see if it's enough six pixels and yep that's about right how did i know six pixels because i've done this before anyway so <laughs> six pixels now again it brought it in a little too much along the top and it brought it in a little too much along the bottom but i'm okay with that all right so now that we've contracted it by that much and we've got the part selected that we want to keep we really want to get rid of the part that's not selected because the part that's selected we want to keep. So the, we already know how selections work. If I were to grab an eraser, which we wouldn't do, but if I were to grab an eraser and I were to make my eraser nice and big and I come out here and try and erase, nothing happens. But if I come in here, it starts erasing because the selected part is the protected or the, the part, I'm sorry, the selected part is the part that's affected. The deselected part or the part outside the ball is the part that you can't touch. So we want the opposite. How do we get the opposite of what's selected? Well, there's a way to do that easily. Select, inverse. This is a command we use, we've been using for years to, because sometimes it's easier to select an object, but what you really wanted was the background. Rather than selecting the background around the object, select the object inverse. Now you got the background selected. So if I say inverse, even though you don't physically see a difference in the little marching ants around the ball, everything else is now selected. The ball is not. So if I were to grab the same eraser and do this, I'm erasing the white and not the ball. So I could do that. That's permanent. That would erase it. But let's undo that. Let's use our mask instead. Let's go to our mask. Let's go to um, our black paintbrush. black paintbrush and that works great but that and again I don't have to do the top part I only need the left and the right so even though it contracted along the top and the bottom I don't have to use those parts unless I want to there we 
we go. So much easier and faster than trying to zoom in and paint just right and get just enough. And this way, I don't ever have to worry about making a mistake because it's only gonna let me paint the outside that I don't want and not the inside. Okay, so now if I deselect Command D, it will always deselect no matter what's selected, the inverse or the opposite of the inverse, the subject. All right, so deselect. Now I got a ball that doesn't have any excess white around it. And if it did, just um, contract a little bit more. And again, zoomed out no one would ever notice the difference. And it might even look like it's a little bit too much white on the right side, but again, if that's the case, then do it again. All right, so now let's go into the third object. So once again, we've got this soccer ball, another one from stock all by itself. Uh, we're gonna go into the uh, object selection tool because it's easier. And this time we're just gonna go ahead and click and it select this one perfectly. So it just depends on the objects. Some objects it will select perfectly, some it won't. If it didn't, let's say, um, I will do this in another one. I was gonna talk about adding and subtracting from a selection, but we'll do it on another, another one, since this one did work perfectly. All right, let's go ahead and copy this one. And let's go over to the other one, and let's paste it. So that one comes in as a new layer all by itself, and we can just call that one ball. And uh, again, we're on that, still on that tool. So let's get out of that tool. Let's go back to the um, to the move tool, which is the one I usually default to when I don't want to do something specific. And now I'm going to go in and just say, let's say I can move this around with the move tool, as the name implies. It's the move tool. It lets you move a layer around. But I, I want to put it down here, but obviously it's way too big. So how do I size this down? The same way we did day one or day two, or lesson one, lesson two. Free transform. Free transform is your friend. It's the way you're always going to scale or move or distort or do anything to an object. So if I go up to my um, edit menu and I do free transform, I usually do it from the keyboard. Command T on Mac, PC, Control T. That will always put a bounding box around whatever is the layer. So the whole layer gets the bounding box. If I were to then um, grab any corner handle, and I want to scale it down into that corner, so I would grab the upper left handle and scale down, then I can put it down in the corner where I want it. I can still move it around while I'm in this mode. I can put it down right on the bottom and scale it down as small as I want or as big as I want. <clears throat> now, let's say I decided, oh, you know what? It would look better if the soccer player wasn't right in the middle of the frame. Maybe the soccer player should be more to the left. So now, again, think of layers. We've got two layers and a background. What's the, well, we'll talk about what's the difference between a layer and a background in a minute. Let's concentrate on the first thing I said. What if I wanted to move the soccer player to the left? Well, I'm, I'm on the move tool. I click on the, the soccer player and I start, oh wait, it's moving the ball. Why is it moving the ball and not the soccer? I clicked right on the soccer player, like right on his leg. How come it didn't start moving him? Undo. Because I'm not on his layer. So layers are whatever you're doing, whichever layer selected, that's the layer it's going to do it to. If I wanna move the soccer player, I click on the soccer player's layer, not the mask, just the layer. Then I pick it up and I can move him anywhere I want. All right, so there you go. And he needs a shadow and he needs other things to look real. I get it. But we're, we're not doing that right now. We're just talking about layers and moving things around. Okay, so I can do this. I can also free transform him. Command T or PC Control T. I can rotate him. So I can get that more. Actually, I kind of like that angle better. I can still scale. So if I need him to be a little smaller, I can do that, or a little bigger. I can um, distort and do other things. If I right click, I get a whole menu of things I can do. So I could flip him around the other way if I needed to. And in that case, I wouldn't want him kicking the ball out of the frame. That's more of a, just a, a, a designer thing. Uh, but I'll flip him back the other way. I could flip him upside down which kind of looks weird, but I could do it. So all of these things can be done when you're in free transform. All I'm doing is right clicking anywhere on the frame itself 
and that gives me all these abilities to do any of this, including warp. We talked about warp, I think, on day one. And warp will let me pull and twist and warp him around and kind of do cool things. Cool. Escape to get out of that. Whenever you're in the middle of something, also, you can, so let, let me do that again. Let's say I got carried away and I started doing distort. Did I do distort? Oh, I'm sorry, not distort, warp. Uh, hold on, escape. Hold on, hold on, wrong thing. So let's do warp again. There we go. I start warping them and I get carried away. I start just like, go, oh, 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 no. And I can't figure out how to get it back. Up here at the top is your commit and your cancel. So if you ever like, oh, no, I'm just, I've gone too far, don't commit. Either hit the escape key on your keyboard or just go up here and click the do not circle. And that will just put it back to the way it was and you start over. So command T, rotate a little bit more, commit, and that's it. All right, now that we got, um, now that we've got, so someone, someone's bringing it up, RB's bringing it up. You can toggle on the auto select. And I, I honestly don't recommend it for beginners. Here's why. Auto select means instead of me having to remember which layer to click on, if I just click, for example, the ball, see how it switched layers automatically? If I click on the player, see how it switched layers automatically? That sounds great, but I, I recommend you start with it off until you get more comfortable with layers. Because it's, right now, this is easy. They're separated. They're distinctly. I can click on one versus the other. But once you start putting a bunch of layers together on top of each other, it's much harder to deal with auto-selecting because you're always on the wrong one. So it's a great feature. I use it sometimes. But I recommend starting out, you turn leave that off or turn it off because I want you to get comfortable selecting the layer you want to be on. All right, so now that we did that, let's go ahead and add one more layer type. We're going to add a text layer. So let's go ahead and uh, grab our type tool, letter T. And I want to, um, oh, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Before we do that, I said I would show you, talk about the difference between layers in the background. So what's this thing that starts out in every image you open is called a background no it doesn't know what the image is so it just calls everything the background oh hang on did i i did that by mistake um the background is the foundation like it's the bottom layer all or the bottom of your image always you can stack layers on top but the background doesn't have all the properties of a layer so if i click on the background notice how all that stuff got turned off i can't lower the opacity of the background i can't um uh, lock any of the transparency or any of that stuff because it's not a layer. It's the background. So just imagine the background as being um, the table and you're stacking things on top of the table. The table doesn't change, but the things you put on top of it can move around, take them off, put them on, change them in some way, but the table stays the same. However, if you want the background to be a layer, you can. You can make it a layer. So how do we make the background a layer? This is so easy now, it used to be like multiple steps. Now all you do is this, is notice it's locked. All you do is just click the lock. So if I click the lock icon, turns the background into a layer. And there's no unclick the lock once you turn it into a layer. It's a layer until you flatten it. All right, so now I can call this one, uh, now that it's a layer, I can call it field. Okay, so now that we got our field image, and let's uh, zoom out. Um, well, that's cool, but now what can I do with that? Well, if I lower the opacity of the field, what do we see? We see these checkerboard patterns, which represent transparency. So it would just print like this, or it would be exported like this, where the background kind of looks washed out. If I go back to the opacity and I do this and bring it back up, what, what would be the point of making the background um, a layer? Is usually because you want to put something behind it. So let's go back to here. Yeah, we'll do this one. Let's drag this image in from the library. That's the other one I, I downloaded, remember? And it just put it in the layers panel wherever I was. So I put it underneath um, the two layers, but above the background. So now I'm going to move it in place. It comes in automatically in free transform, so I can scale it up. Great. And now, and I'll go ahead and commit. And now that I've scaled it up, my background is completely covered. 
but you can rearrange your layers. So that's another layer property. Someone commented that uh, on, on after the on the replay that they've been using Photoshop for a long time, but they never knew you could rearrange the layers. And I was like, I'm glad I could help. And so anyway, I'm going to drag this one down below the field. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Once I drag it down below the field and let go, it disappears. It's not disappear. It's it's just you can't see it because the other layer is completely covering it. That's all. If I turn this layer off, there it is. Turn this layer on, there it is. Turn this layer off, turn that layer off. I've got transparency. So it's it's there, we just can't see it. But now let's do a quick trick. Let's say we click on the field layer, which is above it, and we add a mask. Because remember, you can add a mask to any layer you want. Now that we got that mask on that layer, and we know that black hides Let's go in and let's use black to reveal part of that background that we just added, or that field, that the other field we just added. So I'm going to go to my brush. I'm on black. I'm going to make my brush super big. I'm on my brush tool. Why is my brush getting bigger? What am I doing wrong? Hang on. Whatever reason my brush wasn't getting isn't getting bigger. Hold on, am I on the wrong brush? I'm on the right brush. Whoa, 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 whoa. B for brush. Brush bigger. There we go. For whatever reason it was the keyboard was stuck. All right, so now I got my um, brush and I want to make sure the brush is super soft. And it is the hardness is all the way down, the size is all the way up. And I'm just gonna start painting. And as I as you expected, it's showing me the field on underneath. So I'm just hiding the right side of this layer to show the um, layer below. So if I look at my layers panel, if I look at that mask, that's what it looks like. I just paint it black down the mask to hide the right side of that layer to show the right side of this layer. All right, so now that we did that, now we can do our text thing. And let me just add a little bit more up there. And a little bit more down here. We'll kind of curve it out a little bit. Great. And I'm, I'm working underneath other layers because I'm on a layer that's underneath the ball, underneath the soccer player. So even if I come around here and do that, I'm not touching the soccer player. I'm on the layer below the soccer player. So whatever layer you're working on, you can work without touching the other ones. All right, so let's undo that. I didn't want to do it behind his head. So now that we did that, let's add yet another layer, a new kind, a text layer. So um, I'm just going to come right up here near the top and click. That's going to add some sample text to give me an idea of what size, what font, what color, so forth and so on. So I'm going to pick a different font. And I'm going, I like how it previews it as you scroll. I'm going to use... And by the way, I, I don't I, I don't know which font I want. I just know I want something heavy. So why don't I just type in the word heavy? There we go. So now I can see all my heavy fonts and Fat Frank Heavy is one of my favorites. I always use that one in demos. But let's do uh, Ephra Heavy. All right, so now that I got the right font in there, I want to type in um, the word soccer. All right, great. So soccer is still too small and still not the right color. So now that I started typing, if I want to affect the word I just typed, I need to highlight that word, just like you would in any other program. All right, so now I can go ahead and make the size bigger. Oops, I'm already bigger than the, the, pre, the presets, so let's go here. And there we go. We can um, we could type in a number. So I can say, oh, it's 98 too small. How about 120? Wait, what did I do? Hang on. Oh, that was 120. That's it. Um, but that's still too small. So I can go here, and this is a hidden feature in, the, in some of these options. I can pull down and grab a number. I can type in whatever number I want. But if I hover over the little symbol, notice I get a little left and right. Those are what we call scrubby sliders. So I can just use a scrubby slider to scrub it up. Oh, yeah, visually, that's about what I want right there. Now, last but not least, I don't want it to be black. I, I don't want it to be, I don't know what color I want. But sometimes we, we, it's easier to just use a color that's already in the image so that we know um, 
we know that it matches because it's already part of the image. So let's go in and uh, how do we get a, a different color? Well, there's the, the font, the style, the size, um, the alignment, uh, how, how it looks on screen, the warping, um, character and paragraphs, panels, so forth and so on. But over here is the color. So if I click on black, that brings up my color picker. And I could go in and I could pick different colors and that's great. But again, you know, like I said, I don't know what color I want. Um, so you spend a lot of time in here where, oh, you know what would be nice? How about the yellow in this shirt? What color yellow is that? I don't care. I, I don't have to figure it out. I'm just move my, move my cursor outside of this box and I get an eyedropper. So I can make it the blue in the sky. I can make it the yellow in his shirt. I could make it the white in the ball. I can make it the black in the ball. I can make it the yellow of these buildings or the yellow of these buildings, the green of that uh, fence, the green of those trees. In this case, we want the yellow in his shirt. Great. Now I got that color. So then I can click OK. The color has been locked in. If I come down now and just hit return, I get soccer game, but you notice it's, it's type. That's because the last time I, I worked with type, I did not have it on. I did my own letting instead of letting it do auto. So let's do auto instead. There we go. And see, that's why I don't like auto because it's too much. So I did. This is another just typography trick. Option or alt up and down arrow will let you adjust the line spacing visually. Um, you can always type it in. Anyway, so now I got my soccer game there and I could um, I could always go back in now and tweak the color. So if I wanted that color to be a little lighter, um, I can do that. So it just gave me a nice starting point for the color. Okay, but now let's say that, and I could put the date and time and all that in for the soccer game. But we're, what we're just doing is experimenting with the type layer. So a type layer is always uh, non-destructive. You can always go back in and change the type. You can always go back in and change the font, color, size, anything you want. Uh, so just think of the type as always being live. Uh, it is its own layer by default. So it will always put a layer on the uh, image and it will put that layer on the image above whatever layer you were on. So I was on the field layer. It automatically put it above the field layer. If I were on the ball layer, it would have put it above the ball layer. So whichever layer you started on, when you click the type tool, that's the layer it's going to put it above. And it will always try to name the layer whatever it is you typed. Uh, so in this case, it named it Soccer Game. So I know what text that is. If I were to grab the Move tool and I were to move it, it's now behind my player, which is kind of cool. You might need that effect. If I were to drag it up in the layer stack, it's now above. If I drag it down below the ball, it's still above him, but below the ball. But since the ball is down here, you would never know. Um, now it's behind the ball but still above him. So layer order, your stacking order helps you determine where things will, sh how things will show. Um, just trying to think, is there anything else I want to say about this before we move on? I think that was it. Okay, so hopefully you got a good, like just understanding of how layers work, how layer masks can help you. There's tons more you can learn about layers. You can learn about layer styles, layer effects, blend modes, um, lots more to do with layers. But that should give you a good foundation. Uh, I was hanging on William saying, thanks Terry, I learned more about Photoshop in the past three classes than the past decade. How <laughs> uh, On your own, yeah, because on your own, you're your teacher. And sometimes we're our worst teacher. Uh, we're the worst teacher. Because we're, we're trying to just pick things up randomly. All right, so next thing up, um, I don't want to get into all that blending modes because that, that's just I, it's going to take us more time than we have. But next week, I'm doing a whole class on selections in both Lightroom and Photoshop, selections and masking. So um, if you want to learn more about selections, tune in next week as well. All right, so now we've got, um, we've got a few minutes left. Let's go to our next thing. All right, let's say we want to go to uh, go to 
<laughs> All right, let's open up. All right, let's open up a background. Let's do this one first. There we go. So again, this is not mine. I think it's from Adobe Stock. I did not composite that horse on there. That's the way it came. It looks like it could have been a composite, but I'm not going to spend time trying to figure it out whether it was composite or not. Next up, let's go in and put, put something on this one. Let's go put her on here. Okay, great. And so because there's no bottom to the image, I'm going to put the frame at the bottom. I'm going to scale it down. And let's say I want to put her right here for whatever reason. I'm doing some kind of ad campaign. And um, so I just drug from the library onto this. It, it's in free transform. I can scale it. I can flip it, move it around, distort it, do all those things we talked about. Then, I've, of course, I can lock it in once I'm there. Now, I want to remove this background. Now, we talked about there is a technique. If you have a layer in the properties panel, which I'm not on the properties panel. There it is, properties panel. It's, it's remove background, but notice remove background is not as there is a choice. If I say the reason it's not there is a choice because in the way that I brought this layer in, it converted it to a smart object. Anytime you drag an object from a library into another photo, it brings it in, but it brings it in as a smart object protecting the original. But if I say convert to layers, meaning, um, yep, get rid of the smart object. Don't show me again. I know. Now I get removed background because it's saying I'm not going to tie it to the original. I'm going to just let you do whatever you want to this copy. So if I say remove background, it will do its best to remove that background and add a mask. So remove background tries to do it the right way by not just deleting the background, but adding a mask. But here's the problem with this particular photo. Because of the way it was lit, meaning the lighting on her from the background, a lot of that background colors reflecting on her, especially in her hair. So in this case, it's just hard to do a one click remove background and have it be right. It did a great job on the hair, but it didn't remove the color from the hair. So if you double click on that mask, that will take you into selected mask, into the selected mask workspace. And you can come down and you can say, show it to me as an onion skin. So, or show it to me on layers, either one. And that will show you what you're getting so far. So one of the things I wanna try right off the bat is there's this decontaminate colors feature, which is designed to do exactly, to fix the problem I just described. Decontaminate the colors out of the image from the original background. So if I say decontaminate colors, it, look, it did a great job already. This is before, look at the edges, hang on. And, and again, it's not finished, but that just from that turning that on, it, it got a lot of, a, it got rid of a lot of it on the outside. Now it didn't go far enough in and I've got it turned all the way up. So that's as far as I'm going to get automatically. Now, the other thing I can do is I could try the, um, the ref, not the brush tool, the refine edge tool and the refine edge tool works better when it's smaller and it works better when you start out where the red used to be and you drag in and see what that's doing. It's kind of brushing away that excess red that's in her hair. So you could eventually brush her hair <laughs> and get it all out. Now, again, until it recalculates, it looks like you're putting it back in. But once you let go, it will recalculate and take it out. Oops, and I, un I should undo that, put that back. And there's a lot of it in her hair. But anyway, it's giving you a day. Now, if, it, it's, if it's kind of breaking some of the hair, you can come back in and you can put back put it back in certain spots to get it to get it to look better. There we go. But it's a trade-off. So again, manually doing it and I could uh, hold on. Let's try a softer brush. Softer brush might work a little bit better, but you get the idea. So that could go in. It looks pretty good up here, especially when we zoom back out. 
to where it would to where it looks normal. All right, so now once I click OK, that will create a new layer copy because that's what, what the option I had it turned on to. And that will create a new copy of this one. The old one is still there showing you what you had. And this is going to be a select and mask trick. I'm going to throw away the extra layer. And I'm going to show you a layer that kind of fills in. Remember those broken hairs? If you just simply duplicate the layer it came back with, if I duplicate it, just drag it down and make another copy. It fills it in. It fills it in beautifully. So I don't know why that works. It just does. Because <laughs> it should be the exact same pixels underneath each other. But it just fills in those, those broken hairs. All right. So that is um, one of the ways we can, we can make this work. Now, I'm going to take these two layers. Because remember, we got two layers here. And I'm going to combine them. I'm going to say, I don't want two layers, I want one. So I can uh, merge these two, merge these layers together, and that will create one. It's gonna get rid of the mask, so keep that in mind. If you don't want it to do that, then don't merge them or make a copy that's merged. Um, but anyway, I got rid of the mask because I wanna show you one more thing. The color is off in this. This looks like a hazy blue day and she's you know red in a, ba in, in a studio. It just doesn't look right. So one of the ways you can do this to make it look better is to try a neural filter. We talked about filters before. Filter, uh, neural filter. There's a neural filter called harmony, harmonization. And when I turn on harmonization, it lets me select a layer, which in this case, I want to select the background because I want to harmonize the layer already picked with the background. And this is um, before and this is after. So it kind of gives her that look of being in the same environment. Now, it might be too much, so you could bring down the strength of it and kind of like just use it to tone your layer to make it look better against that background. And that is, unfortunately, my time today. I am out of time, folks. So hopefully in these three parts, these three sporadic parts of learning Photoshop Crash Course 101. You've got some good foundation without me going through sing every single tool one by one. You got enough to get going. And from there, you can, of course, pick up and learn more about all the other things now that you've got a good foundation on what works and what doesn't. Um, with that said, next week is all about selecting and masking, the whole hour. Selections, masking, selections, masking, all the different techniques for selecting that I can cram into an hour. So uh, cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one. Stay tuned for more from Adobe Live.